right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 tonight. Ephesians chapter 5. Be ready. You might just want to take notes tonight because I'm going to be hitting a lot of scriptures tonight. I'm going to be all over the place tonight. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to give you time to turn to all the scriptures tonight. But this message is really important. One of the things that gets people in trouble uh, with false doctrine many times is bad terminology. And uh, we, we, we do need to be careful. I, I correct myself all the time. I find myself sometimes using bad terminology that's not really biblical. I have said things before. I, that it, there's been things that have come out of my mouth when I've been preaching that if, if you wanted to get real technical with me, I was saying some stuff that, you know, is false doctrine. Okay? But at the same time, if you... Uh, tell me about that false doctrine, you know, I, I would definitely reject that. You know, while what I said sounded bad, it wasn't what I meant. And sometimes you have to just kind of, you know, you got to get past that. And it's like, well, I know what he said, but that's not what he meant. Okay. But at the same time, if we're not careful, if we don't correct those things, we can end up causing confusion. And sometimes too, people, they get, they say things so much, you know, they end up getting real stubborn. And I, I do, I believe that there is, there's a lot of false doctrine and there's a lot of things that, you know, I've tried to, you know, straighten people out on other preachers, but there's so much bad terminology that we're using that it makes it really difficult to teach things that I think should be very simple. And so I want to show some examples of this tonight. And this, I, the title of my message, it's a really long title, but the, the title tonight is the church, congregation, believers, saints, elect, the bride in Israel. And we're going to look at those things. That's, it's just a bunch of different titles that we see that, and many of these are often misused. And so we get, we get bad doctrine because of that. And so let's read Ephesians chapter five. I believe this passage is one that in most Baptist churches is completely misused, completely misunderstood. And it's like when you do, if you start questioning pastors on their beliefs, they don't even agree with how they're using the scripture. You know, a lot of things they're actually saying, they don't agree with it. And I want to make a statement here before I get into the message that might sound shocking to some of you, but at the, at, wait till the end of the message before you get shocked and horrified. But I don't believe in the rapture of the church, and I don't believe the church ever replaced Israel. Now, that might shock some of you. Ah, not, Brother Tommy, I've heard you talk about the rapture. I've heard you talk about replacement theology. But listen... I don't believe in the rapture of the church, and I don't believe the church ever replaced Israel. And that might sound weird, but if that sounds weird to you, it's because you've probably had some brainwashing because you've heard some bad terminology your whole life. And I'm going to show you tonight, you don't believe that either. And you might think you believe those things, but you don't. And so let's go ahead and read Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Okay. Now I read that passage, but I'm going to, it's, uh, it's going to be a while before I explain it to you. So just keep that passage in mind. That passage passage is often misused. And once again, you know, misuse, misunderstanding of terms. It often leads to false doctrines and it brings much confusions with different doctrines of the Bible. And so when we fail to understand what words mean, you know, we often struggle with understanding certain truths that the Bible teaches. And so one of the, you said one of the reasons that people struggle with issues of the rapture and with Israel is because they fail right at the starting line. They fall on their face right from the starting line because they make statements that just factually are wrong. And, and when you say things like rapture of the church, okay, if you pre, if I, if somebody gets up and I'm going to preach a message tonight on the rapture of the church, well, he's already failed right from the starting because you know what? There is no rapture of the church. Okay. That, that, that statement is bad. You know, and then, you know, when you say things like, you know, these guys that preach against what we teach about Israel, 
I'm going to, you know, I'm going to refute this whole thing and I'm going to prove that the church never replaced Israel. Well, that probably isn't going to be real hard because, you know, the church never did replace Israel. Okay. And once again, I'll show you what I mean by that. But those two statements, you'll see by the end of this message, they don't even make sense. Okay? And so I don't believe those things. So first off, let's look at that term, the church. All right. The church. And most of what I'm going to say, I think everybody would agree with here uh, about what these terms mean. Most Baptists across the board would agree. And so, you know, the first time we see the word church used in the Bible, it's in Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. One thing that Baptists like to argue about amongst each other is, you know, when did the church actually start? You know, did it start with Jesus and his disciples? Did it start at Pentecost, you know, or did it start in the wilderness with the church in the wilderness? And we like to argue about those things. And that's not necessarily what I'm going to, I'm not going to prove when it started tonight. But one thing I think we would all agree with, Baptists across the board would agree with, is that a church, it's a visible body, of baptized believers. Okay. A, a visible body, a, an assembly. It's a called out assembly. I think, you know, how many does there have to be for it to be a church? Well, the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in the midst of them. I think there needs to be at least two or three, you know, and I think, you know, obviously it is, it's a, it's a public thing. If you just want to go have your little group thing in your house and call that church, you know, I don't, I don't believe that's church. Now, if you start a church in your house, that's fine, but it needs to be a very public thing. I think church ought to be as public as you can make it. The fact that you're meeting there, that you're assembling there, you need to let everybody know where you are, what you're doing, and you know how many people does there have to be before it's called a church? Well, I would say two or three. If somebody wants to disagree with that, that's fine. I don't think that's going to mess up anything in this message, you know, but another thing too, you know, how much doctrine does that church have to have right before it's actually a church? Okay. Because there's a lot of groups out there that call themselves churches that, you know, we would say, well, that's not a church. You know, the Mormon, you know, the Mormon church, that's not a church. You know, the Catholic church, that's not a church, but you know, and this is just my opinion and this isn't, this isn't a big deal either, but you know, I think as long as there are some saved people assembled there, I think it's safe to say it's a church. Why? Well, we're not going to read through it, but if you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, were not some of those churches really bad? I mean, some of those churches had some really bad doctrine, but yet Jesus called all of them a church. So, you know, how much doctrine do they have to have right? How much stuff do they have to line up with us before they are not considered a church anymore? And so I believe as long as there's some saved people there, as long as there's some scripturally baptized people in that group, I think God would consider it a church. But, you know, what if most of the people in the church aren't saved? Well, that's not church, right? But here's the thing. What percentage of a church needs to be saved for it to be considered a church? Because does anybody think, I don't think there's anybody in the world that thinks everybody that goes to church is saved. I don't think there's any pastor that thinks everybody in their church is saved a hundred percent all the time. I mean, if that was the case, then you know, there's, I've seen many times where church members have gotten saved. Okay. So, uh, you know, what percentage, you know, you know, does it have to be at least 50%? Well, you know, if it's 50, then could it be 40? You know, how, how do we know? I think the key is as long as there are some saved people there. And I believe that if a church uh, you know, churches who don't have their doctrine right, I believe they're in trouble with God. I believe God's upset with them. I believe a church that doesn't purge out the leaven, eventually that the whole leaven or the whole lump will be leaven. And I believe it will event, it can eventually come to a point where it's no longer a church. So turn over to Revelation chapter 2. Let me show you one passage there in Revelation chapter 2. And really, it's, it's interesting because... When you look at this church here that's mentioned, uh, the church of Ephesus, it seems like one of the better churches. They were doing everything right, but they left their first love. And it says, of the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Those candlesticks represent those seven churches. In verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, 
and thou hast tried them that say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. I believe when he said, I'll remove your candlestick, in other words, you're not going to be a church anymore. Yeah. Now, does that mean these people are going to cease to exist? No, but I believe that there can come a point where God no longer sees that place as a church anymore. Why? Because the whole lump has become leaven. And if you don't keep false doctrine out of the church, eventually you will probably clear out all the saved people in the church and you'll have churches of 100% lost people. Amen. And I believe those they're out there and I don't believe God recognizes those as churches because they have, they've lost their candlestick. They started out a church, but the leaven came in, leavened the whole lump. They are no longer a church anymore. And so... You know, and I, I do, I think it's completely fine to disagree with what's considered a legitimate church or not. But one thing I think we would all agree on, everybody, is that not everyone who is a part of the church is saved. And if that's the case, then why do we call it the rapture of the church? Because is it going to be just church members that go up in the rapture? Or is it going to be the saved that go up in the rapture? Okay, because so said you can be a member of this church. And if, but if you never believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not saved. You're not going up in the rapture. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we baptize you. You're not going up in the rapture. So why would we call it the rapture of the church? Because I think most Baptists too agree that we do not, we reject the universal church. I don't, we don't believe in a universal church. It's a visible, local, called out assembly of people. That is what a church is. Okay? And so, uh, scenes that were, we know that not 100% of them are saved. We know it's not the rapture of the church, it's the rapture of the saved. So that's the church. Now, the, another term, the congregation. Okay, look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. I believe that the church and the congregation are the same thing. I think it's basically the same word. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? Y'all see that in the midst of the church in Hebrews it says that. Now turn, uh, look at Psalms chapter twenty-two and verse twenty-two. Psalm twenty-two, verse twenty-two. We're going to see that Hebrews is actually quoting Old Testament scripture right there, and it says, "I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will praise thee." Y'all see that. It's quoting Psalms, but it uses the term church in the New Testament and congregation in the Old Testament. You know what that means? It means they mean the same thing. It means it's the same word. All right. So uh, Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. It says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was with the church in the wilderness, with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with the, our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again, into Egypt. Notice this. This is talking about the congregation, all right, which uses the term church right here. But this is talking about the congregation of Israel, and it's crystal clear in here that in the congregation of Israel, they weren't all saved, were they? Right. Now look at verse 39 or uh, 40, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, ye have offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away behind Babylon. Right here, it makes it very clear that the church in the wilderness or congregation, as it was called in the Old Testament, it had saved and lost people in it too, didn't they? So we see that the, you know, the church 
and the congregation basically the same thing. Now, in the Old Testament, did they run things differently in the congregation than we do today in the New Testament church? Yes. Okay, obviously. But at the same time, that assembly of people that was a, a, more of a national people, more of a, you know, a physical people, you know, God has changed that now to where, you know what, it doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile. You know, bloodlines don't matter. We now have a different work. Jesus finished all the sacrifices when he died on the cross. You know, we don't do those things anymore. But understand that that congregation that was back then made up of the nation of Israel that had saved and lost people in it. It's the same thing today in the New Testament. We have a called out assembly of people, a church, a congregation that had, that's supposed to be all saved people, but we know there's lost people too. There's no doubt about that. So we see they're basically the same. You know, it's crystal clear that not everyone who is part of the congregation or the church in the wilderness was saved. You know, there's no doubt many people today who are members of a local church are not saved. And, you know, the, and what was the name of the congregation in the Old Testament? It was Israel. That was what they were called. They were Israel. That was what that congregation was called. And, you know, so everyone agrees that not everyone who was of Israel went to heaven. Okay? I don't care how Zionist you are. No Zionist is going to say everyone who was of Israel went to heaven. In, not even in the Old Testament. They wouldn't say that. Why? Well, Romans 9, 6 says, For not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Now, that's New Testament. That's talking about today. But it was the same thing back in the Old Testament, wasn't it? There were people who were of Israel, but they weren't of Israel, were they? Why? Because they didn't believe God. They were lost. And so we see today, same thing. They're not all Israel that are of Israel. You know, just because you're from Israel doesn't mean anything. You have to be saved. You have to be of faith to actually be of Israel. Amen. And so we see really nothing's changed. And so if we believe that a church is a visible body of believers and that not everyone who is a part of our congregation is saved, then why would we say the rapture of the church? Hey, okay? it's, it's just, I don't know where it got started, but people say these things and they get repeated over and over. And I, I guarantee you, I've said it before when I've been preaching, you know, looking forward to the rapture of the church. One of these days, God's going to come and he's going to rapture his church. You know, I'm, I'm sure I've said it before and I might accidentally say it again in the future. And if I do, just give me, you know, don't call me out right there, but just give me a funny look. Like, you know, you said rapture the church, but once again, sometimes it's not what I say, it's what I mean, right? And so, and, you know, you got you to gotta interpret for me a little bit sometimes. But yeah, why would we say rapture the church? Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. I think this is very interesting. He says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if you are a part of the church, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with them? Is that what it says? No, what did he say? He said, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Now that's interesting because guess who he's talking to here? If you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians. Now if he's talking to the church and if he's talking about the rapture of the church, why would he throw that little thing in there for if we believe? You know why? Because if, well, if that was to the church, obviously all of them believe, right? No, because you can be a part of a church, be accepted into a congregation, and not be a believer. And if you are not a believer, you are not going up in the rapture. Amen. And so it is. It's, just, it's, it's a bad thing to say, rapture the church. It doesn't make sense. It's very clear. Being a member of a church will not get you saved and it will not have you be taken up in the rapture. And you know what? This has been said so much. If you go down south, especially in the Bible Belt area, there are Baptists down there, some of the Baptist brighter types, that believe it's only the church that it's getting raptured. They don't believe. There's, there's people out there that believe if you're out soul winning and you lead somebody to the Lord and they get saved, but they don't. And then the rapture comes five minutes later before they've had a chance to get baptized and join a Baptist church. They believe they're not going up in the rapture. Now, where would that come from? Because you won't find that anywhere in the Bible, but you will hear it said over and over again, the rapture of the church, the rapture of the church, the rapture of the church. 
And so these people that hear that, and down south they make a huge deal over what the church is. You know, and it's got to be Baptist and you got to be able to trace your lineage all the way back to John the Baptist. And they get into all that stupidity and the thing, but the thing is, you know, so yeah, I agree. If somebody's a part of, you know, the Catholic church, you know, that, that's not a church. I get that. You know, if somebody gets saved and they are not a part of a local church, yeah, they're not in the church. But they're still going up in the rapture because the rapture is for believers. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, not for the church, nowhere in the Bible will you see that it is just for the church. And once again, Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to get back to that in a little bit and show how some of this stuff happens. But once again, these people fall flat on their face right on the fit from the starting line. Because of the fact they're just getting their terminology wrong. They don't understand church, what congregation means. And so, third term I want to look at is believers, all right? Believers, those are the ones going up in the rapture. It should be the rapture of the believers. Believers are the ones who are going to heaven. Believers are those who are of faith. The, all who have ever gotten saved, got saved because, by grace through faith. They are believers. That go, you know, we've, we're not going to read Hebrews chapter 11. But it's talking about their faith. It talks about their faith. Throughout the so-called dispensations, it talks about their faith. They believe God. Back in Genesis, you know, Abraham believed God. It was accounted unto him for righteousness. Believers are those who got saved without works. Turn over to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. This is what a believer is. And I say this, I show this to you because of these bozos that are out there that are teaching that they got saved by faith plus works in the Old Testament. That's a bunch of garbage. Okay, and, they, and there's a reason they do that too. They have to separate Old Testament believers from New Testament believers so they can hang on to their pet Israel, physical Israel. And that's, that's why they do this. And this is why you know, they're trying to prove something false and it always leads to greater error in other areas. But listen, nobody ever got saved. By faith plus works. Ephesians, or Romans chapter 4 verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works. If he were justified by works. He hath whereof to glory. But not before God. It sounds like Abraham has anything to boast about. Just like us. But it says verse 3. For what saith the scriptures. Talking about Old Testament. Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh, that worketh is the reward. Not reckoned of grace. But of debt. Okay, if you work here for your salvation, that means God owes you. Okay, God's not a debtor to you. Not, not at all. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. I heard somebody say the other day, well, no, Abraham was saved without works because he was like in a separate dispensation from you know, the rest of these Old Testament people. But there was many in the Old Testament. It was faith plus works, just not Abraham. Well, what about David? Because even as David also described it, the blessedness of the men unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? Was this something that was just for the Jews? No, it was, it's for the uncircumcision too. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. It was, you know, faith is something that God identifies Abraham with. When we have faith, God puts us in the same camp in the same category as Abraham. That's something that we have in common with him. How was it then reckoned? How did Abraham, when was Abraham reckoned to be of faith or recognized to be of faith specifically without works? Was it in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had being yet uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Abraham got saved years and years and years before he was circumcised. He got saved years before he did any works, years before he was circumcised, years before he offered up his son Isaac. He was already saved Amen. when he did those things. He got saved years before when God told him to go into a strange land and God told him he was going to multiply his seed to the stars and he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Amen. 
That, that, was, that was what it was. And so we see very clearly here that, you know, this, this uh, salvation, this, you know, this thing of faith, this is, this is nothing, uh, you know, this is nothing new. It's been around. Old and New Testament. As it turns out, people got saved in the Old Testament the same way we do today. And there, there's a massive portion of Baptists who are trying to say they're not dispensationalists when it comes to salvation, but they are dispensationalists when it comes to these groups that we're talking about. Okay? Because they, they do, you know, I call them out for this all the time, and they'll say things like, oh, no, you know, we don't, we don't believe in dispensa- you know, dispensational salvation, but God's not done with Israel. Well, you are confused right away because of the fact that you don't even understand who Israel is. And, be, and so because of, once again, because they've got their terminology wrong, they can't get, you know, what should be real simple doctrines. And so they are, they're hanging on to this dispensationalism because they don't want to admit they've been wrong on Israel. They don't want to admit that they're wrong on things like the rapture. And so they are, they're hanging on to it. And it's, it's really two-faced and I'm kind of getting sick of it. I, I really am to tell you the truth. It gets me, it gets me fired up because it, it, what they're saying doesn't make any sense. So you're not a dispensationalist when it comes to things like salvation, but you are with everything else and with all the terms that we're looking at tonight. They are with those things. And so if it wasn't about nationality in the Old Testament, and if it, and, and everyone would agree it's not about nationality today, there's neither Jew nor Greek you know, in Christ. You know, they'll admit that, yeah, today it doesn't matter. But then we see very clearly it didn't matter in the Old Testament either, but now it's going to matter in the tribulation after we get raptured. That doesn't make any sense. Or we're going to go back to the Old Testament economy. You obviously you, you don't understand what you're talking about. It was the same thing in the Old Testament. So yeah, it's, it's going to be the same thing in the tribulation that it wasn't in the Old Testament. That just happens to be the same thing as it is right now. And they just they can't seem to get that. It makes no sense. There, listen, there's a reason that genealogy stopped after Jesus. Okay, why, did, why were genealogies so important in the Old Testament? Why do we have to read all those names? Very simple. Because God made very specific prop, prophecies about a seed that was going to come. Made very specific prophecies about a seed. Okay? And it was going to come through the line of Abraham, and then Isaac, then Jacob, and David. I mean, God made those things very clear. And so the Bible put all those genealogies there so it would be clear that Jesus was in fact a fulfillment of all those prophecies, that He was in fact the Messiah. But it doesn't matter now. Because the seed already came. Galatians 3.19 Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator until the seed. We don't have time to read all Galatians 3, but that seed was Jesus Christ. Once He came, those things don't matter anymore and they're not going to start mattering again in the tribulation. That's just ridiculous. No, folks, the seed came, but yet we have New Testament supposed preachers that still want to make a big deal about the seed of Abraham referring to the physical descendants. They don't matter. What matters now is if it's of Christ. And thank God, you know, because of those preachers that have been out there preaching the truth on this stuff, guys are trying to, they're getting their Bibles and studying a little bit, trying to defend this stuff. And you know what? I've been listening to some of these guys. Some of them are getting closer to the truth. I heard a preacher the other day. He was talking about how, you know, there's two Israels. He's admitting there's two Israels. There's physical Israel and there's spiritual Israel. You know, I agree with that. There's physical Israel and there's spiritual Israel. He admits physical Israel is not saved. That, you know, that it's spiritual Israel. You need to be, you know, people who are Jews, they need to get saved just like we do right now. But after the rapture, In the tribulation, God's going to go back to dealing with the Jews. Why? That doesn't make any sense, folks. The seed already came. That doesn't matter anymore. And so it's just, it's ridiculous that they can't recognize this. And so, you know, if being a part of the nation of Israel or congregation didn't necessarily get you into heaven in the Old Testament, you had to be a part of the spiritual nation even back then And if being a part of the church today doesn't necessarily get you into heaven, you have to be a part of the spiritual nation of Israel 
then why does being a part of the nation of Israel matter in the tribulation? We need to think about these things sometimes, all right? You know, the, these preachers need to stop playing their video games and watching their Fox News, or whatever it is they do, and they need to start just thinking a little bit. And let's just, you know, let's just admit it. You know, as repulsive as dispensationalism is, you know, Baptists, they do, they hold their nose when it comes to that because they're desperate. Most Baptists are repulsed by the teachings of dispensational salvation. They're repulsed by it, and they should be. But yet, they do. They put up with it. They'll listen to some of these dispensationalist preachers. They'll hold their nose because what they're teaching advances their whole rapture slash Israel teaching. And they just need to admit that they've been wrong and they need to throw that stuff out. Amen. They need to throw it out in the trash where it belongs. And so, it's very clear, believers, you know, church, congregation, same thing in the Old New Testament. Believers, same thing. Old and New Testament. Another term, saints. All right, look, saints. Saints mean, basically means sacred or holy ones. Psalm sixteen three says, "But to the saints that are in the earth." Okay, all right. Now, if you've been had any brainwashing from Catholics, you think saints are somebody who's already dead, already in heaven, somebody that the Catholic Church has declared sainthood on. All right. Uh, if, if you've been a part of the Catholic Church, you might struggle with that. But listen, you know, saints here it says are in the earth. Okay, and it says, and to the excellent, in whom is all my delight, Psalms 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Okay, if you're saved today, you're a saint right now. Okay, we don't declare sainthood, all right, on people. Okay, and I think probably 100% of the people the Catholic Church declares sainthood to are in hell while they declare sainthood on them. These people are not saints. Acts, or, uh, yeah, Acts chapter 9, verse 13. In the New Testament, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Now, I'm showing you this because some of these people who are really desperate to hang on to their pet Israel stuff, they try to make the argument that saints is a reference to Israel. But wait a minute, why did he say this in the New Testament? Well, notice it was the saints at Jerusalem because those saints just happen to be Jews. And so therefore, yeah, I was talking about the believers, but they were Jews. Saints is always about Jews. Uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 25. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make certain contribution for the poor saints, which are at Jerusalem. See, notice again, it's the, they're in Jerusalem, right? So these people, yeah, they were saved, but they were also physical Jews. Saints is always talking about Jews. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? What's that talking about? Well, if it's talking about Jews, I guess we could go to the unjust judges because most of them are Jews. Right? But no, it's talking about the saints. It's talking about the believers in the church. Verse 2, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world should be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? It's clear he's talking to them there at the church in Corinth. And saying, they were saints. They were sacred. They were holy ones. They were God's people. Why? Because they were believers. Revelation 13, 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. It's talking about the Jews. Once again. Talking about the saved. The saved. And there's more examples I can show you where it's talking to you know, Gentile believers and calling them saints. But they try to make it out like it's always talking about Jews. But listen, it's not. Saints are saved people. Okay? And all these people out there, you never see the church mentioned after Revelation chapter 4. Never see the church mentioned. Once again, they don't understand church. Okay, It's not about church. It's about the saved. It's about the believers. It's about the saints. That's what it's all about. And yeah, you don't see the term church, but we do see the term saints. So that's, talk, that's talking about us. us. But they do. They want to make it about the Jews. No, it's saints. Old and New Testament, it's always just referring to believers. It's talking about saved people, not an ethnic group. It's never about an eth ethnic group. In Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so, very clear, you got, you know, once again, an Old Testament term, New Testament term, it's the same thing. Saints. It just means believers. We see again, no difference. 
And we, and I, so I wish we had time to go through all the scriptures on these. We don't. But look at another term, elect. Okay? Another, uh, the term elect. Isaiah 45, 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. Right there. Jews are the elect. Right? I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Isaiah 65, 22. They shall not build another inhabit. They shall not plant another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall enjoy the work of their hands. Okay? Talking about Israel. Matthew chapter 24, verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's days, those days shall be shortened. That's not talking about us. That's talking about the Jews. The elect, the Jews are, it's always the Jews that are the elect. Verse 31, and he shall give his angels at the great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. They have to make that mean the Jews, because if they admit that this is the rapture, and that's us that's the elect, then it's very clear in that passage that the rapture comes after the tribulation. And so they, they you know, no, elects Jews, elect the elect, it's Jews, it's always Israel. But wait a minute. Romans 9, 6, we read this verse before, but we read ones after it. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall they be called. That is, they which are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. Okay? doesn't matter if they're from Israel. They have to be of faith. They have to be children of the promise. And it says in the chapter before that, in chapter 8, not long before that, uh, Romans 8, 31, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. You all see that right there? It's very clear in chapter 8. He, when he's talking about the elect, he's talking about believers. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justify it. You know what that means too? That means I don't get to go up to you and say, you know what, I don't think you've changed enough. You didn't repent of your sins enough. You're not saved. I saw you smoke a cigarette. There's no way you're saved. Listen, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justify it. You didn't get justified when you threw away your cigarettes. You got justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the proof that you're saved. I hope you get rid of those things. I hope you repent of your sins. But that is not justification. Okay, that You are only justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Very clearly here he's talking to saved believers and he calls them the elect. And then in Romans 11 verse 1, hath then, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God's not done with Israel. I, that, that's automatically what gets added every time you hear that. God's not done. We have heard that so many times. People believe it. I talked to a guy the other day. Well, I don't believe in dispensational salvation, but I don't believe that God's done with Israel. You know, and you, know, you, you try to help these people. But verse 2, it says, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. When it says that God hasn't cast them away, it means he hasn't cast them away to where they can't be saved. They can be saved. Paul's saying, I'm proof of that. I got saved, and I'm of Israel. So God hasn't cast them away. They're not reprobate. Okay, They can be saved if they will believe on Christ. But verse 4, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even back in Elijah's day, when Israel was as wicked as all get out, you know what? They weren't all wicked. There were 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. There were, in Israel's most, one of their most wicked times, when Ahab was the king, there were 7,000 who were of spiritual Israel. There were 7,000 elect. There were 7,000 believers. And he says, verse 5, Even so at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. What made them elect? The fact that they were believers. The election of grace. We are saved by grace through faith. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, 
but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Talking specifically about Israel, it's like, no, they haven't got what they were seeking for, but the election did. And the election actually included people who were physically from Israel. But what made them a part of the election? The fact that they were believers. The fact that they were of faith. The fact that they were saved. That's who the elect are. The elect are saved people. And they can be Jew or Gentile. But nobody is elect just because they're a Jew. And you can't find that anywhere in the Bible. And so, you know, you can't, you can try to say all these like, well, in Romans here, you know, those here in Romans 11, he's specifically talking about saved Jews. So therefore, kind of like, you know, the argument they try to make with saints, you know, these, this elect he's talking to, it's talking about saved Jews, not necessarily saved Gentiles. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because in Colossians chapter three, verse 12, it says, put on therefore as the elect of God. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. He's telling, hey, to the Colossians, he said, you are the elect of God. And so you know what? Put on these things. All right? These are some things that the elect of God should do. But he called Gentile believers the elect. Okay? Because once again, it has nothing to do with nationality. It has nothing to do with you know, genealogies. It's about being a believer. And once again, we see that term elect in the Old Testament. And we see it in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's talking about believers. In the New Testament, it's talking about believers. It, while it mentions Israel specifically in the Old Testament, we learn in the New Testament that, you know what? Just because somebody is of Israel doesn't mean they're of Israel. They've got to be saved. They've got to be a believer. So you cannot do that. That is a horrible misuse and misrepresentation of Scripture when you try to make elect about a physical race of people. That's ridiculous. It's very clear, elect is still the same thing. And so then, the bride. Okay, This is another one too, Baptists love to argue about. The bride. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, Because here, here's one of the main reasons they say rapture of the church. This is why they say rapture of the church. You know, Because it is, it's about the church. Christ loved the church. Christ died for the church. It's about the church. But listen, I think all Baptists would agree that you can be saved and not be a part of the church. So why are they doing that? Why are they making it out like Christ's death was for the church? And they do it because they're misusing the scripture here. Let's read it again. Uh, verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, what are we talking about here? Is Paul explaining you know, church doctrine here? Or is he talking about a husband and wife relationship? He's talking about a husband and wife relationship. He's not teaching deep church doctrine here. He's talking about a husband and wife relationship. And he compares the love that Christ has for the church to the love that a husband has for his wife. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands and everything. We're still talking about husbands and wives. Wives are supposed to be subject to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Okay? So now, wait, that makes it look like it's all about the church right there. But wait, no, listen, this, this is about husbands and wives. But how, you know, how do we explain this? Well, first of all, once you know, the context of this passage is Paul is comparing the husband's authority over the wife to Christ's authority over the church. That's what he's explaining. You need to understand that. And second, you know, he's telling the husbands they should be willing to sacrifice themselves for their wives like Christ did for the church, okay? If a burglar breaks in the night, guys, don't send your wife after the burglar, all right? You go after the burglar, okay? If somebody points a gun at your wife, you stand in front of your wife, you don't put her in front of you, okay? That's the way it's supposed to be. That's what God wants. That's what God intends. And so this passage, it's not saying that Christ only died for the church, okay? Because the Bible also says he died for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, did he die for the church too? Are we not included? Are we not a part of the, you know, the inhabitants of the world? Yes. 
But is that passage saying he exclusively died for us? No, he died for the sins of the whole world. Okay? So, you know, you can't, people are just taking that verse and they're taking it places that they shouldn't. This passage is about a husband and a wife, not about the church. And so, yeah, he gave, Jesus gave himself for everyone in the church, but he did for the whole world too. So we need to understand that. And the reason the church will be without spot or wrinkle, because he's going to, he's, he wants to present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Well, how is that going to work? Because I can just tell by looking at y'all, y'all got some spots and wrinkles. All right. What's going on? You know, the, but it's the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Christ that cleanses us and makes us without spot or wrinkle. One of these days when we see him, like I mentioned this morning, we're going to be like him, but that's not going to have anything to do with any work of our own. It's going to be with the work of Jesus Christ. It's through his blood. He's able to do that. Okay. That's his work. That's him doing that to us. All right. And he's going to do that to all those who are saved, not just the church. Okay. All who are saved. And so, you know, this passage, it's not trying to teach a doctrine about what the church is. That's not what this passage is, but it's about husbands loving their wives. And, and pastors, our preachers, are building all kinds of church doctrine around a passage that's not about the church and what it is. It's about husbands and wives. That's what it is. And so this passage, too, it's not teaching that there's a difference between the church and Israel. Because that's what people are doing, too. It's about husbands and wives, but people do it. No, you know, the church, the New Testament church is the bride of Christ and Israel is the bride of God, the father. That is ridiculous. Okay. And I, I've disproved that from the scriptures. Well, let, let me show you a few things here. To disprove it again. Revelation 21 verse nine. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked to me saying, come hither. I will show thee the bride of the Lamb's wife. Now listen, this is the only time in the Bible where we see the bride specifically referred to. Now in Ephesians, we see a comparison, okay, of the church as being, you know, the wife of Christ. All right? We see, we see a comparison there, but understand that the bride is something that's in the future. Okay? And look what it says. You know, it said, we reject Baptist brighterisms. All right, we we do not we do not believe in those things. Uh, but I'd love to be into the Baptist brighter things. I like any doctrine that makes it we're Baptist. It's all about us and nobody else. All right, but I just I can't make that fit the Bible, so I, I have to reject that. I don't want to. All right, if you can prove that's true, let me know. I'll be anxious to jump on that. But you know, unfortunately, it doesn't fit the Bible, so it goes with my flesh. But uh, it doesn't go with the Bible, so I, we don't preach that. But it says, He carried me away into the Spirit, into a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God in her light, was like unto stone most precious, even like a jasper stone as clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the, tw and the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. I find that interesting because this is the city. I'm going to show you the bride, the lamb's wife, and he doesn't show them necessarily a group of people. He shows them a city. Okay. Now understand a city. It's not about a geographical location. It is about a people. Okay. But this city is going to be inhabited by people of all ages who are believers, old and new Testament. We have those, you know, those, uh, those gates with the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And, verse 13, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Y'all see that? It mentions the, you know, 12 tribes. But the foundations, which is interesting, because usually the foundation comes before the wall, doesn't it? And was not... Israel before the New Testament church. But once again, this shows, you know, Jesus said, behold, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And the Bible talks in Ephesians about how we've been, I'm not going to quote this right, about being laid on the foundations of the 12 apostles and the prophets. And so, you know, I can't completely describe this to you, but it is very clear that yeah, the church, you could say the New Testament church, Jesus started it with his disciples. But either way, 
people who are included in it are those from the Old Testament too. The gates, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So, you know, it's very clear, you know, we can argue about this stuff all we want, but in the end, it's going to be saved people from the Old and New Testament Amen. who are the bride, who are a part of that city. The bride clearly, it's a city, it's, it's a city, it's not about a geographical location, but it is about a people. And these people are from the Old and New Testament. And I believe, I do, I believe that the, okay, that the church is the bride of Christ. However, once again, the bride of Christ will not, or, you know, the church will not become the bride of Christ until we all are like him in heaven. Say, so, well, what do you mean by that? Well, here's the thing. We will be a universal church after the rapture, won't we? Because we will be caught up together. He will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to another. And we will all be together in one assembly. And at that point, yes, we will be one church. We will be one assembly at that point. And when that day comes, then we will be the bride of Christ. And so, uh, it, you know, that is, that's the way that works. And it is Old and New Testament. Same thing. And so then finally, Israel. Real quickly, I want to go through this because once again, you got the people out there, you know, Israel's the bride of God. And it says in Hosea 2.19, And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. And I will betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And thou shalt know the Lord, and it shall come to pass. And that day I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they that hear... Uh, they that shall hear Jezreel, and I will sow unto her me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them that were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. If these people who are saying that Israel is the bride of God would just read a little farther, they would see that verse in verse 23, where it says, I'm going to call them who are not a people, my people. Talking about the Gentiles. That's talking about us, and that's what, and we're not going to go there. That's quoted in Romans, one of the ver passages we're allowed to claim as ours, according even according to the dispensationalists. It makes it very clear that this group that God has betrothed to Himself, we are a part of that group. But He's talking to Israel there. Yep, and that well, guess what that means? That means we're Israel, folks. Very clearly, Galatians 3, 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. It doesn't get any clearer than that, folks. And so we see church, congregation, same thing, Old and New Testament, no difference. We see believers, saints, elect, all the same thing. Old and New Testament, the bride, those who are believers of the Old and New Testament. And the same thing too with Israel. There's always been a physical Israel and there's always been a spiritual Israel. And spiritual Israel goes to heaven, physical Israel doesn't. And if you're saved, you are of spiritual Israel. And so, uh, you know, it, it's of it's of the utmost importance that we are correct in our terminology. When we get sloppy, we're more likely to end up in error on important doctrines. And just like I said in the beginning, I do not believe in the rapture of the church, and I do not believe that the church replaced Israel, but I do believe in the rapture of the saved. I absolutely believe that. I believe in the rapture of the saved, slash saints, slash elect, slash believers. I believe in that 100%. I do believe that spiritual Israel replaced physical Israel. I absolutely, I absolutely believe that. And so the thing, the reason so many people, when they hear us preach the truth on Israel, even on salvation, on the election, all that stuff, they get lost right away because they don't even understand those basic terms. And, and part of it, I think it comes from sloppy terminology. I think if you, you went. You found your most Zionist, you know, pre-trib person in the world. If you just had an argument with them about these terms, I think they would agree with us. But at the same time, when we start getting talking about things like rapture and Israel, 
all of a sudden they're all over the place and all confused because they use wrong terminology all the time and it's it's messed up their thinking. They think the bride is you know just the church, not just the saved. Once again, not everybody in the church is saved. Not everybody, everybody in the church is a bride. I hope 100% of us in here tonight are a part of the bride. I hope 100% of us in here are believers, but we might not be. There could be some lost people among us. We don't know. We, and so it's important that we get these terms right and it will help us avoid a lot of confusion on these important things. And so I hope that was helped you tonight. I hope you understand these terms. And so with that, let's go ahead and stand together.